Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection as usual. Today I would like to shuffle cards. So I would like to explain uh, what card shuffling is. Mathematically speaking, obviously just presenting one model of card shuffling. Uh, in the end, a model well, kind of depends on the model. That was a very deep tautology. Um, anyway, so I just present you one model. It, I'm not saying uh, that this is the only way of doing it. And the model I'm going to present goes back to, well, people like Diakonis, which was work out really, really nice, linked in the description that I'm following. Um, and it was this big idea, turned out in the seventh, up in the 70s of the last century, that a lot of, well, pr processes, diffusion processes or whatever, uh, in this case, card shuffling, can be modeled using random walks. Um, so a random walk, usually you think of it like a particle, uh, popping around, floating around kind of randomly in a two-dimensional space, for example. Um, but here, card shuffling can also be modeled using a random walk, which is kind of cool, actually. Uh, I will try to explain how that could work. So that's the main topic of this video. And I will only focus on one uh, model of card shuffling. All of them are kind of the same. It depends a little bit how you want to shuffle your cards. But I will be very precise because in the end, well, that's what we need to do, right? <laughs> Without any precise question in mind with any or any precise setup there's basically nothing you can say anyway okay but let's get started so um card shuffling is kind of the point i would like to do today here so the, to the top left picture but there are many other many other um kind of uh shuffling problems of the same type that you could also model using random walks which i'm not going to address at all uh, for example uh the famous diffusion like really particle somewhere um, or DNA can be shuffled. There are shuffling processes in DNA. A uh, link is in the description. It's, it's really, really kind of amazing. And maybe more down to earth and related to YouTube is, uh, well, kind of every kind of music app, also YouTube, will have some shuffling algorithm for playlists. Um, whether they're really, well, whether they're really random is a kind of very different question. So as a programmer, you always run into the problem that the kind of our brain doesn't really like random patterns. In some sense, our brain likes symmetric patterns. So most of the shuffle algorithms are kind of a little bit biased. Um, but let's ignore that problem anyway. Brains are weird. So let's just uh, assume that you want to shuffle a playlist and there's a shuffling problem, kind of randomly shuffling the playlist. So there's zillions of potential shuffling problems around in the world. Uh, so it kind of makes sense to ask for, hmm, maybe we can try to model them mathematically. And all of them, from all of them, maybe the easiest one is the classical card shuffling. And that's what I'm trying to do. So kind of model the classical card shuffling using some, some ideas from mathematics, uh, graph theory, group theory, we'll see. Kind of that's the setup. Um, and now we'll be a little bit more specific. So I'm doing a very, very, very silly way of shuffling cards. But that's what I chose for this video because it's kind of the easiest to explain. It's very silly, as we will see, and it will take a long time, but it works in the end. So uh, it's called the top to random shuffle. Uh, this is really just the following shuffling. You take your deck of cards, you take the top card, you put it somewhere randomly, and you repeat. Not very efficient, as you probably already can guess. But we will see a mathematical statement in the end that proves that this is not very efficient in, in one way or the other. Anyway, that's certainly how I would shuffle cards because I'm just absolutely a loser and I can't shuffle cards at all. But a professional card player, no way that a professional card player would shuffle cards like that. I take the top one and I put it somewhere. Eventually, again, this will be a theorem. I'm going to show you the, the deck will be random, but it takes you a while to get there. Anyway, uh, as I said, I chose this uh, shuffle because it's kind of the easiest one to explain. It's really, really simple. Take the top card, shuffle it somewhere, and I will model that, or, well, not, I, I follow, of course, the reference, as I said, linked in the description. So and this is modeled by using a permutation, and it's really just the permutation. Um, you would like to put it in the i's place. So it's a permutation i, i minus one, i minus two, 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 two one, where this is really just read as i goes to i minus one, I minus one goes to I minus two and so on. And I don't, I think of the cards now as being ordered and that's exactly what I do. So here's an example. Um, I take always the top card and I shuffle it somewhere. So it goes to the fourth position. So position is one, two, three, four, five. So one goes to four, but I somehow start count in the opposite order. 
So four bumps up to, so it's actually happening here, four bumps up here, four, uh, three bumps up to two, two bumps up to one, and one bumps down to uh, four, and that's the kind of the cycle notation, four, three, two, one. Here's another example, slightly sim uh, simpler, just uh, the swap of two and one. Okay, so I would like to model the card shuffling, the top to random card shuffle, as taking those permutations, really just those cycles that start somewhere and then count down. So I, I minus one, whatever. And just do that repeatedly. So I model, or we, that's already a pretty nice idea, actually, just to model a shuffling via permutations, but maybe not super exciting because in the end, there's a symmetric group that I'm using here, the permutation group. I mean, it's a card shuffle group. There's a reason why it's called the card shuffle group, I guess. Um, anyway, <laughs> so this is really the setup I would like to use to have those um, elements of the symmetric group if you like that language. And I just take specific one of them, not, not all of them, just really, really specific ones, the ones that count down, right, to count down. Let me call them the countdown permutations. That's not the standard name, I warn you, but uh, I still count, uh, call them the countdown permutations. Okay, and here comes now the really the main idea. Now you can model this whole card shuffling by, by a random walk on a certain graph that is called the Cayley graph for the setup. Uh, so what is the Cayley graph? Well, I would like to model, uh, well, I have my symmetric groups here. So I have S2, S3, this is somehow supposed to be S4. So my vertices are just the elements of that group. So here would have the unit element. Well, maybe I just call it identity, identity element and the, the two one permutation. And the edge itself are our allowed permutations. So uh, this is the two one permutation. And it's just saying that if you add identity and you apply the two one permutation, then you get to the two one permutation. If you apply it again, then you get back to the identity. That's why you get this very easy graph, which is just one, two vertices and two edges. Okay, um, a little bit more complicated is this graph. So this edge is still the two one permutation. And this edge now is a slightly longer cycle. Remember that I would like to use those. Let me use different colors here. This is the blue one. And the other one is the green one. Um, and the green one is a slightly longer one, the three, two, one, the countdown. And if you think about it for a second, the three, two, one, it doesn't, so the elements here are the, uh, the vertices are the elements of the symmetric group. And this is how the actions of those jumps me around in this graph. If you think about it for a little bit, then this has order three, and you can see this in the graph because, well, you can see um, this triangle here, and you can see this triangle here, which really just says this element is order three. This element has order two, and yeah, of course, you have those little, little cycle type things. So that's then the Cayley graph for S3 and you go on. So the Cayley graph for S4, um, still same notation, blue is to one, uh, green, I think in this notation still is three to one. And then you have the red one. I hope I'm not doing anything wrong here, which would be the slightly longer one, right? And so on. For the next one, you have again a slightly longer one. For the next one, you have again a slightly longer one. And this defines your graph by just looking how those act elements act on uh, the elements of the symmetric group, just by composition. So the graph, it's called the Cayley graph for those generators, is just my gamma here. Vertices are the permutations, the elements of the symmetric group, and the edges correspond to my allowed shuffles, right? So there's this uh, countdown words. So the top two random shuffles. And the key idea that drove this, this whole subject of modeling things using random walks on certain graphs is that you can now render a model, you can now random the random walk, uh, you can now model the, uh, the system of shuffling as a random walk. And that just means, well, let's, let's stick to this graph here. You're at, at each stage, you have some vertex and you randomly choose the edge uh, to go to the, well, some of the adjacent edges with same probability in this case, to go to some other vertex and you continue and you continue at each step, you kind of flip a coin um, or whatever makes sense and jump to a different vertex. Uh, not in, in, it, I said whatever makes sense because of course, if you have more than one or more than two edges, maybe flipping a coin is not the best idea anyway. Uh, you roll the dice, whatever. At each step, there's a probability that you would choose edge x. And then you go edge X and you end up somewhere else. And there will be another probability that you choose whatever edge and you, you just walk around these graphs and you wonder, is there some kind of uh, limit state of those graphs? And now you can precisely say what I want here. 
So the whole system is now modeled as a random walk on those funny graphs, gamma, with a slight catch that I also have to <laughs> the really interesting do nothing shuffle. The do nothing shuffle is identity shuffle. So you secretly need to add those little loops here, which correspond to the identity edges at each vertex. Um, because in principle, you could also be very, very smart. Well, I'm certainly very smart. I probably would do that and take the top card and just put it where it was. That's a legal shuffle. Um, very good. And you model that in the graph by just adding those stupid edges. Anyway, but otherwise, just do the same graph as before, the Kaley graph, now with stupid edges, with stupid loops. And every edge in this model is equally likely. You could vary that if you want to. You could say certain shuffles are more likely than others. But in this model, everything is equally likely. Um, so for example, in this example down here, I have three edges, right? I have this edge here, let's say for this vertex, this edge, and I have the loop. Uh, so each one, you would take each one with probability one over three, because it's equally likely. And then you do your random walk um, on this graph. And there's a theory of random walks on graphs that you then can apply to kind of tell you something interesting about the model. The first thing you would do here is you would say that the walk is what is called a gothic. There are certain uh, things you could test whether it's a gothic. And this just means that it will be eventually be mixed. Definitely not all more, uh, walks are ergodic, so we can we can model the very stupid shuffle, where the only allowed shuffle is exactly the you put your top card and you don't move it at all. That's not ergodic, and that's kind of makes sense. It shouldn't be because the deck eventually certainly is still the same, so you never mix it really. So this is already a statement. So you could prove that this is a mathematical proof that um, the top to bottom shuffle eventually will mix your deck. But you can do better, basically by um, analyzing the spectrum of this graph. So I've done this down here. You did the graph corresponds to a matrix, which you weight by the probability. You compute the eigenvectors. You compute the eigenvalues, um, what you usually do uh, in <laughs> linear algebra. And these will tell you the, the growth rates. And from the growth rates, you get some bounds on how long it will take for uh, the, the deck to be completely shuffled. In particular, in this case, you could solve everything very nicely. And here's the statement. Uh, so for each for, for each bound you want, you can go as close to zero as you want, where the top to random after k shuffles is basically uniform. Uh, so smaller equals the difference is smaller equal than e to the minus c. And uh, just to give you some explicit numbers, so e to the minus five is roughly one percent. So let's just say it's one percent. Uh, so if you take c equals five then your deck is really, really already randomized. It's uh, very close to the uniform uh, uh, distribution. And well, let's say you have a usual deck with n equals 54 cards. Then you need this number of shuffles to get below 0.1%, so the 1%. And if you just plot in the numbers, so 52 and 5, it takes you a while. So you roughly need 500 shuffles. So it's really, really inefficient. And you can measure precisely how inefficient it is. But it actually eventually gets you there because it's ergodic. Say it again. It's a kind of cool way of doing it. You just model it uh, on a graph. You solve some linear algebra problems for that graph. And you get those life statements like um, is the deck will eventually be mixed, which is kind of obvious for this way of shuffling cards, it's not quite obvious in general. This, for this way, it's kind of obvious. But anyway, and you can also get some, some bounds how long it will take. So here you can see where roughly 500 shuffles to shuffle the standard 52 deck card. It will take you a while. So um, you, you should get started to, <laughs> to do the top to, uh, the top to random shuffle. And that's not the only shuffle you do. So as I said, no, no professional player, no professional card player, I hope at least, I won't, I won't to speak for professional card players, but I hope they won't use the top to bottom shuffle. Um, the, the much more popular one is a riffle shuffle. And it's really like this. You, you cut the deck in half, basically, roughly, in two pieces, A and B. Okay, so here's A, here's B. And then you riffle them, like riffle cards together, and you end up with something. And you can, again, model that using the permutation here, this permutation is this permutation, if it hasn't messed up. Um, you get a bigger set of permutations or a different set of permutations. You play the same game with the same random walk, 
but now on a different graph because you have different permutations. Um, it's a bit tricky to explain. It's not really hard. The link is in the description. That's why I'm trying to avoid it. And I've chosen the other one, but it's really kind of the same setup. Um, and again, you can prove that it's ergodic and you get a much better bound than this or much faster convergence than the one here by analyzing the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the graph. And you get something like this famous uh, result that seven riffle shuffles are actually enough to randomize your deck, whatever that means in the end. Um, yeah, so point of this video today was kind of to explain that these random walks are actually um, very, very strong in the sense that they can model a lot of, well, kind of natural questions that come up in real life. So shuffling problems is not just related to cards. Shuffling problems appear somehow everywhere. Um, as I said, in my example, using the YouTube playlist, for example, and you kind of want to solve those shuffling problems in some nice way. And you can actually do it by analyzing, in the end, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of matrices or of graphs, which is a kind of cool way uh, to get bounds for how long it will take to do whatever, in this case, to randomize the deck. And you also get results like it is actually possible to randomize the deck, which is not always the case. Keep in mind that the silly shuffle, uh, don't move your card at all. Well, that's also a shuffle, but it certainly will never get you there. So it's not trivial at all. Um, all the usual sh shuffles, like, like riffle shuffle and top to bottom shuffle, they certainly will do the job. And you can prove that mathematically. That's pretty cool. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I will see you next time.